switch them on. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be looking primarily at verses 25 through 33. So for, for, the, for those of you who have been with us now studying through this letter, and we're here last week, for example, and the week before, uh, to the guys, I commend you for being here this morning. We, we might need to lock the doors. Um, but this is an uh, important passage of scripture, as always, as is, as are they all, amen? So let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to go ahead and read. Uh, I'm going to just start in verse 18, and then s- jump over to verse 25, moving forward. So this is in the context of our exhortation as a church to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God. And the Apostle Paul begins to unpack what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like in the church and then in the family and in marriage. So that's where we pick up in verse 25, where it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, we come into this passage as we do any, Lord, asking that you would give us eyes to see the truths that are here before us, that you would give us uh, courage and faith, Lord, uh, to live them out in this present world. Lord, as we look at the ravages of uh, sin upon the family and the marriage and in uh, the world at large, Lord, we know that it is your heart to restore to redeem, to renew, and God, we ask that you would do that this morning in our hearts, Lord, that not just the husbands, Lord, but that every single person in this room, everyone watching online, would respond to this work of your Spirit, and that we would surrender ourselves to all that you're wanting to do. Father, we, we trust you for this. You're the only one who, can, who, who knows each of us intimately. You're the only one who knows our history, our our baggage, uh, the hurts and pains, the victories and triumphs that we come into this room with this morning. And you're the only one who can touch uh, each of our hearts and meet us exactly where we are and lead us further into your purposes. And so, Lord, we trust you for this. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. 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 All right. Have a seat. Last week, we looked again at uh, this topic as we we're going on in this topic of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week, we looked at the passage of Scripture where it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. And uh, it was interesting. A couple of people came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Pastor, you kind of went a little soft, went a little soft. Uh, maybe I could have gone a little harder on that issue. But, you know, God knows, and we trust that He's... Uh, you know, got what he wanted to across to us this morning. So guys, you're in trouble this morning. We're not going to go soft on you. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it would have been interesting to hear some of the conversations between husbands and wives after church last week, I can imagine. You know, it's unfortunate that submission is basically always viewed in a negative light. Uh, It's unfortunate. Uh, of course, you know, there, there's a reason for that. 
this idea of wives submitting to their husbands is not very popular in our current world, but that's largely based on history. You know, the, the, the fact that this idea of submission has often been viewed in a negative context and has been abused and neglected and uh, exploited. And, uh, you know, when we look at that, it, uh, when we think about submission, part of the reason we think of it negatively is because uh, of history. And, and the reality is, is that people are flawed. We're, we're sinners. We are flawed, but God's design is not. It's very critical that we make a distinction between those two things. The historic precedents, you know, would lead us to have a negative view of submission. But, the, you know, even here in Cyprus, you know, we live on the island of love. But, you know, in spite of that grand title, Cyprus has, uh, has just a higher divorce rate as any other country in the world. And this is the consequence of sin. Sin ravages the family, it ravages marriages. But in contrast to the historical precedents, we have a biblical precedence. And God is seeking to reverse the results of sin in our lives individually, in our <clears throat> excuse me, in our marriages, in our <clears throat> excuse me, in our families. And he wants to restore. Uh, I would say even renew and improve upon his original design for marriage. Now, we talked last week about how submission is not a matter of personal worth. A lot of times we think about submission as uh, being someone who's spineless or has no you know, courage to uh, enforce their own will or agenda. Uh, but we, we looked at that last week, and submission isn't about value, uh, you know, that a man is more valuable <clears throat> than a woman. It is about authority. God ordained authority within the marriage and the family unit. <clears throat> when husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, along with their children, live out biblical values, biblical truth, and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we will see a strong family uh, functioning in its God-given capacity. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me say that again. When husbands and wives, mothers and fathers and children are, are functioning in you know, uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, according to biblical mandates, then the church will experience strong family units that uh, are functioning in our God-given capacity. Now, there's a lot of us here this, this morning, and I don't want to, you know, ca uh, make anyone feel like what we're talking about doesn't apply to them or doesn't have any, you know, uh, application to them. W there's a lot of tragic stories here in the room this morning. A lot of us come from broken families. Maybe you're in the middle of a, a, a terrible situation in terms of your marriage or family this morning yourself. This, none of this is intended to bring condemnation or to uh, bring us into this, this place where we feel unfit for the kingdom of God, but at the same time, we are called to respond to the truth of God's word, to that work of his Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, uh, you know, here we have this admonition in the letter to the Ephesians to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to love one another, to submit to one another. And when we do that collectively, a beautiful, powerful thing happens in the body of Christ, and it changes not only our, our community, but it impacts the world that we live in. Our heart's desire here at Calvary Chapel is to influence this city for Christ, to, to create a hunger and a thirst in people who don't know God to, to come to Him and discover who He is and what He can and wants to do in their lives. 
But we also, at the same time, have to acknowledge and confess that none of this is possible apart from the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. John 15, 5, Jesus said it himself, apart from me, you can do nothing. Anytime we step up to any sort of biblical mandate and try to do it in the strength of our own flesh, we're going to fail most often, if not just be miserable in the process. But when we are moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, following His lead, we can do all things. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, All of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, in this context, you know, we see that the only way that we can, you know, live out these, these truths, these spiritual truths, is through the, the power of God's Spirit in our lives. And what was true for the women last week is equally true for, the, sorry, what was true for the wives last week in our study is equally true for the husbands this morning as we move into this passage. Husbands, <clears throat> love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. As we look at this uh, challenge that's set forth to both wives as well as husbands, we see that a, a standard for comparison is given in both instances. Last week when we were looking at wives' relationship to their husbands, we read there in uh, verse 23, uh, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as the church is subject to Christ. There's the comparison. As the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, now, a casual look at church history proves to us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the church has never uh, submitted to Christ perfectly. And so, you know, as a wife, you might be tempted to think, you know, well, that gives me a little bit of wiggle room. <laughs> the church never submitted perfectly to Christ, so I don't necessarily have to submit perfectly to my husband. And you might look at that as a loophole of sorts. But we understand that the only reason the church has managed to advance itself uh, is by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, as it has submitted to God's truth and to God's spirit. And so it is the church's submission, uh, I mean, in spite of the fact that the church's submission to Christ has been far from exemplary, God has still managed to forward his, <clears throat> his purposes in the world. Amen. Now, so that, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know what the deal is this morning. <clears throat> so that was the standard for comparison with the wives last week. This morning, the standard for comparison for the husband is very different. Sub, uh, we, we see that in the context of these comparisons, the wives' directive is much easier, in a sense, than the husband's. Whereas the wives will ultimately answer to God and not their husbands regarding this call to submission and respect, consider how the husbands will also answer to God for their response to this exhortation. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves loved the church so the natural question to ask well how did christ love the church if a husband's supposed to love his wife as christ loved the church how did christ love the church so we're going to look at four things quickly this morning and we're not even going to cover this entire section exhaustively uh we're gonna there might even be a part two after all i mean you know, Paul gave three verses to the wives, and he gives seven verses to the, the husbands. So we'll see whether there's a part two to this next week or not. We'll see how it goes. So four things I want to point out that, that kind of embody the love of Christ for the church that 
husbands are supposed to emulate to their wives. First of all, his love was unconditional. His love is unconditional. Romans 5.8, I'm reading from the New Living Translation here, said, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Hallelujah, that's good news. That's worthy of an amen and a hallelujah. God did not wait to send his son Jesus into the world to save us. Uh, he didn't wait until we had gotten our spiritual act together. The Bible says that while we were dead and buried in our sins, God in his great love and in his great mercy sent Jesus into the world to live and die and rise from the dead on our behalf. He didn't die on the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross because you and I were irresistible, that we were so righteous and so religious and so pious that he just couldn't help himself. The, the, the contrary is the truth. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we read there, for the joy set before him Jesus endured the cross, the joy in front of him. And that's in the context of a, of a race being run. The finish line for Jesus was you and I saved, you and I redeemed, you and I sanctified in the Holy Spirit, you and I glorified in eternity. That is the joy that was set before Jesus that he was willing to go and endure the horrific sacrifice that he made upon the cross. He did not die because of who we are as sinners. He came to die for us because of who we will become in him and through the finished work of his redemption and his spirit. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning, it's a great opportunity just to kind of address this question question. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're waiting to get right with God. You know, you're waiting until you get your life cleaned up before you will come to Christ. You know, I, I, I remember having that fleeting thought in my mind before I came to, to Jesus that when I was dead in my drug addiction and in my sinful life, I, you know, remember the Holy Spirit initially you know, trying to get my attention, and I'm thinking, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm a heroin addict. I'm an ex-convict. You know, I'm, a, I'm in trouble. I've got, you know, so many different issues in my life. How can I possibly come to God until I get my life together? Well, that's never going to happen. That's, in fact, that's the reason why Jesus came, to, to clean up our lives, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. You know, uh, for you and I to try and make ourselves worthy of, of Christ's sacrifice, worthy of God's love and faithfulness in our lives, you know, it, it's... We just lack the capacity, we lack the fundamental ability in our old nature to, to clean ourselves up. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a funny little lighter video to kind of highlight what it looks like for you and I to try and clean up our own lives. Anybody who's had a two-year-old will appreciate this film clip. So you ever had a toddler who's made a mess? And that toddler goes to clean up that mess. And you've got the parent basically, you know, standing by going, oh, no, this is not going to go well. Uh, so check out this video. Hopefully it'll drive the point home. <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> no? All right, maybe it wasn't meant to be. Yes, no? There we are. Oh. Those? Mm, this one for me? Uh-oh. I gotta clean that. Thank <laughs> you. 
That's a great picture of you and I trying to get our lives together before we come to Christ. It's never going to happen. We just don't have it within ourselves, even if the desire is there. Inevitably, you will have the parent stepping in saying, let me do that for you, <laughs> right? And that is exactly what Jesus did. He said, let me do this for you. Amen. And so he came into this world, he died on the cross, and he supplied us with the righteousness that you and I could never supply for ourselves. The great apostle Paul, the man who was, you know, uh, prior to his, his encounter with Christ, was an incredibly religious man, a Pharisee of Pharisees, wrote this to the church in Philippi. In chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Listen, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. If the Apostle Paul, this, this Pharisee of Pharisee, or this super kind of holy religious guy, recognized that he could never live up to God's standard of holiness, if he was willing to forsake that form of righteousness and run to Christ, how much more so must you and I? God sent a Savior because we could not save ourselves. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus put it in such beautiful, powerful, simple terms when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We must first recognize that we are spiritually impoverished, spiritually destitute, spiritually bankrupt before we can receive the grace of God, the forgiveness uh, that is offered to us through Christ. Jesus' love, through the Father's love. And so, like Christ's love for us, this unconditional love, our love, husbands, for our wives, should also be unconditional. It is not dependent on whether our wives are having a good day or a bad day, whether we perceive them as being worthy of our love or deserving of our love as husbands who are loving our wives as Christ loved the church, then we ought to be loving our, li our wives unconditionally. Marriage. <laughs> Typically, after you get married, you discover a thousand little things about your wife that you never knew before your wedding day. These little things that you couldn't possibly learn until you're in a, the context of a long-term, close-quarter relationship with a person. No amount of premarital counseling can prepare you <laughs> for the realities of the demands of marriage. That's just the, the, the simple truth. The physical, the spiritual, the mental and emotional aspects that uh, only the passage of time and constantly changing circumstances will bring to light. So when we talk about wives, I'm sorry, husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, we're talking about unconditional love. And when we say unconditional, you know, we understand that that's a radical term. And probably the closest thing that we as husbands, you know, 
understand in terms of what unconditional love looks like is, is what we feel on our wedding day, perhaps. You know, I was just at a wedding very recently, and it was beautiful, young couple in love. They've been working hard for years towards this day, and, you know, there was just, it was a magical moment. And you could see them gazing into each other's eyes as they exchanged their vows. And, you know, I'm looking at my brother, and I'm thinking, you know, man, he's deep in it. <laughs> Unconditional. Easy to believe on your wedding day. But people change. Everybody changes. Time. Age brings about change. And some people age or change more graciously than others do. I think about the sacrifice that wives make in bearing children, just that alone, that on its own, giving birth to a child and the changes that that brings in their physical body, their chemical makeup, all of that alone can bring about huge changes in, in the life of a wife. But men are largely oblivious to this when they make that commitment, when they step into the confines of marriage, into the, the vows of marriage. The spotless bride over the, matter, uh, over the passage of time becomes tired, and especially when it comes to childbearing, oftentimes an emotional bundle of nerves that husbands oftentimes just haven't counted the cost, haven't considered the realities of what this long-term relationship, this long-term covenant means. And so how do men respond when their wives change in front of their, their very eyes? Well, tragically, the numbers show us that a lot of husbands start to look for a new model, look for something younger, something less complicated, something newer and fresher. So gentlemen, husbands, let me ask you this question. Do you want God to treat you the way you treat your wife? The attitude that you have? All of us, I believe, want grace from God every single day. Hopefully, we're here this morning and we recognize that we need God's grace every day. We need God's grace for every situation we're confronted with. You know, I'm a sinner I'm a sinner that's saved by the grace of God, but I need God's grace more today than I ever have in my life. So God, help us to learn what it means to love our wives unconditionally. Now, closely associated with unconditional love is sacrificial love. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He loved it sacrificially. What does Paul say? He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He gave himself for her. He didn't give somebody else. He didn't give something else. He gave himself for her. And husbands, I believe when... A wife is really looking for the ultimate expression of love from you. It's going to come in the form of sacrifice. How much is she worth to you? How much do you communicate her worth to her? Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, I'm sorry, Jesus' sacrifice embodied the totality of his life, his death, I'm sorry, his, his human incarnation, we could say, from cradle to grave, from womb to the tomb, Jesus' life was a sacrifice for humanity. And that sacrifice was climaxed up at the cross, at his death upon the cross. And so one commentator I came upon recently put it this way. So Jesus stepped into our world and died. 
Husbands are to do the same for their wives. Gentlemen, have you stepped into your wives' worlds and died? <laughs> died to yourself? Died to your will and ambitions? At least in terms of how they relate to, uh, directly in the context of strengthening, protecting, cherishing your wife, your marriage, your family. One of the reasons why, you know, this is strange in my eyes is because men are so attracted to the idea of self-sacrifice. It just depends on the context. You know, there's something in men that they're wired to, you know, this idea of heroism, uh, you know, bravery, courage, right? You know, all, all these boys growing up and they're always out, you know, I remember growing up as a kid and we're always playing war and cops and robbers and, you know, anything where we're the champions and the heroes and we're overcoming the bad guys, all of this stuff. You know, it's just kind of hardwired into men to have to be attracted to this idea of self-sacrifice. And men are willing to make incredible, to take incredible losses when it comes to certain things. Making money. Men will make huge sacrifices to make good money. Men will make sacrifices to experience pleasure, to achieve success, to gain recognition. Men are often on the, the forefront of challenging limitations in the world, whether it's in the field of science or war, social reforms, freedom, human rights. Men are always pushing the envelope to go faster and farther and higher and deeper. Most of you guys read about this five men that died last week in the submersible uh, ship. 3,000 plus feet, I think it was, below the surface of the earth, going down in the submersible submarine to see the, the Titanic. $250,000 a seat, and the submarine imploded. You know, they knew the risks. They had to sign contracts before they went on that. But that just kind of highlights the heart of many men, most men. You know, this desire to push the envelope, to test the limits. Much of the advance of civilization has come at the cost of great sacrifice. Not just men, women as well, but Men tend to kind of be on the cusp of those things. And so again, in a man's economy, bravery, courage, and heroism are highly prized characteristics. So why is it so hard for a man to be self-sacrificing when it comes to his wife? Why is it so hard for us to be dying to ourselves when it comes to our marriage. And I think it's largely because the idea, listen, gentlemen, I'm just trying to be real. This is all coming from my heart, my own experience as a, as a husband who is married way above my station. <laughs> as a husband who has an incredibly gracious wife, a lot of this is flowing out of my own experiences and the school of hard knocks. The idea of sacrifice is very different than the reality. We love the idea of self-sacrifice because it's dramatic and maybe it's romantic. And, you know, we read the books and we watch the films and all of that. And, but marital sacrifice feels far less glorious than the sacrifice Christ made, for example, to change the world. We're told as husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And we might think, well, 
Yeah, but when Christ made his sacrifice, it changed everything. And hallelujah, it did. And the sacrifice that I'm making for my wife, you know, it's not changing anything. At least it doesn't feel like it. The idea is very different from the reality. The idea, the, the reality of sacrifice in a marriage is day by day, moment by moment, and not just a one-time ultimate sacrifice that costs you everything. Reminds me of Peter, the apostle. You know, on the night that Jesus was going to be portrayed, Peter, you got to love the guy. You know, he just was so on fire, so committed, and, and he was ready to go as far as he was concerned. And when Jesus told him, you know, tonight I'm going to be, you know, arrested and betrayed, Peter was like, I'm ready to go to prison and to death for you, Jesus. And he meant it. But the problem is Jesus didn't want him to die, at least not at that moment. He wanted him to live for him. He wanted him to be a witness for him, to spend the remainder of his life testifying to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted a greater sacrifice from Peter than just to die in a blaze of guns and glory. Jesus wanted him to live for him daily. And as disciples, that's why we have this admonition from our Savior himself. He says in the Gospel of Luke, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself what and take up his cross daily. Daily. Now, some of the husbands are thinking, yeah, my wife is my cross that I've got to bear daily. No, <laughs> your wife is not your cross. You are your cross that <laughs> you need to take up. You need to crucify yourself every day. And while our sacrifices in the context of marriage may not change the world, it will change your wife's world. It'll probably change your world. It'll change your children's world, for sure. And who knows what impact your family will have upon the community and what impact that community might have upon the world around you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So we got unconditional We've got sacrificial. Third, we have tangible. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says, To him, that is Jesus, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus didn't just give us lip service when it came to expressing his love for us. Every single word that Jesus communicated regarding the love of God was backed up by his entire life and every action that he made. Jesus loved the church not only in words but in actions. And as husbands who are called to love our wives as Christ loved the church, we must do the same. 1 John 3.18 John says this, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, there are some husbands here this morning who may need to learn how to even say I love you more often. But on the opposite extreme, we can say I love you a thousand times a day. And if it is not supported by our actions, by the decisions we make, the way we spend our time, the things we do online, the way we use our money, if it's not backed up by all of these tangible expressions, then it doesn't mean anything. In fact, if you're saying, I love you, I love you, I love you all day long, and it's not backed up by action, then it just becomes noise doesn't mean anything. 
and it will have the opposite effect. Our wives need substance from us, not just sentiment. Our love will translate into reality. It will translate into the way we use our time. It will translate into the amount of attention we're giving. It will translate into sensitivity in terms of what our wives' needs are. And that is probably one of Ben... Darlene might differ on this point, but as far as I'm concerned, this has been one of my biggest struggles. Sensitivity. Being aware of what her needs are. Being aware of what she's saying to me. You know, I've got this terrible habit of going in one ear and out the other. One of the reasons why this is so scary for men is because it's, it delves into the realm of emotions. <laughs> One groan out of the whole room. <laughs> That's scary, you know, for a lot of guys. Na you know, dealing with emotions for men is like navigating a minefield, you know? You're just wear we're afraid to put the next foot forward. What's going to happen? Walking on eggshells. But we have to figure out what love looks like tangibly to our wives. And that means learning what makes our wives tick. Now listen, in a room like this, we got a lot of different people from a lot of different nations, different backgrounds, different cultures. And so this is going to kind of translate differently for everybody. But there are, you know, these are biblical principles that really apply across the board. So it doesn't matter whether you're American or, or Russian or Cypriot or African or British or whatever. These are biblical principles. And we have to learn how to love our, if, if we're called to love our wives as Christ loved the church, we need to know what that means to them, not what it means to me. My concept of love is completely different on a lot of levels than my wife's concept. Over the years, it's become more balanced. Amen? If she was here, she would say amen. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> might not be a loud amen, but it would be amen. <laughs> Learning what that means to our wife, what it means for our wife to be able to say, you know, to know in her heart that she is the most important person in my life, this side of heaven. More important than my parents, more important than my brothers or sisters, more important than my friends. Listen, listen, this is the world we live in, more important than my Facebook followers, more important than my online gaming community. I can't even believe that's a thing, but it is. It's, it's a huge thing. I refrain from sharing an illustration of that. So, husbands, loving your wives, unconditional, sacrificial, tangible. It's got to have substance. And lastly, it's all we have time for this morning, spiritual. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And I, I think we're probably going to spend more time on this next week in addition to bringing in other aspects. We'll look at the last several verses of this passage next week. Spiritual. Husbands, you know, as, as believers, as followers of Christ, and this is regardless of whether you're married to a believer or an unbeliever. Obviously, it's easier if you're married to a Christian, but if you're not, 
You know, again, we've all got different stories, different backgrounds, but living out our faith in front of our wives, living out our faith honestly in front of our wives. That means that as a husband, it is my responsibility to ensure that there is a spiritual dynamic in our marriage. That I am, we are in the Word of God. That we are, you know, as a husband, when we're dealing with different issues in our lives, I have to be able to bring God's promises into the equation as we're trying to work through issues. It's my responsibility. Jesus said, I'm sorry, Paul said that we might sanctify and cleanse our wives with the washing of water by the word. Bringing all of the biblical principles and spiritual realities that we find in God's word and in a life of the spirit into the reality of our day-to-day decision-making. Prayer. We must be men of prayer. We must be praying with our wives, or at least them seeing that we're men of prayer. Praying for our marriages, praying for our children, our family, our friends, for the things going on around us. As men, we should be leading the way in terms of ensuring that our families, again, if this is a context of a Christian marriage, getting to church, even if you're not married to a believer, seeing that church is important to you, fellowship, serving the Lord is a priority. All of these things comprise of what it means to be loving our wives as Christ loved the church, unconditional sacrificial, tangible, and spiritual. We could spend tons of time on all of these, unpacking them for days, guys. As we are summing this all up and, you know, going home to chew on this and hopefully apply these things into our marriages... Just a word of encouragement and maybe a, a, a ray of, you know, uh, excitement at what could result of our walking in obedience to these things. First John 3, 1 John 3.1. John, the apostle, at the very end of his life, as he penned one of the last letters that he would write to the church, an old man, the rest of the disciples, the rest of the apostles are dead by now. John would have been the sole surviving apostle at this time. And he says in chapter 3, 1 John 3, 1, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And I think that's so beautiful and incredible that at that stage in John's life, he still was marveling. He was still amazed at God's love for himself, at God's love for his people. As John contemplated God's unconditional, sacrificial, tangible, and spiritual love for his people. He was just like, wow. Wow. What kind of love is this? And so husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. There's no guarantee, but if you are able to get a hold of these truths in, in the context of your marriage, you may very well find you have a wife who is saying the same thing. Wow. <laughs> what kind of husband is this? Demonstrating, living out the love of God for you, showing that you are, uh, that you, you have proved that she is the single most precious person in your life. 
There's only one way it's going to happen, guys. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for our time and your word this morning.